السلام عليكم <تصفيق> بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين sorry let me get the microphone set up how is everybody alhamdulillah good morning alhamdulillah I'm happy to see everyone's faces here bright and early um, this is a uh, inshallah hoping to make this a regular uh, monthly uh, experience inshallah where we'll have our Thursday night program for like the young professionals. Um, and then Saturday, Friday will obviously be Juma'ah and then Friday night we'll do some, some stuff for family. And then Saturday mornings, uh, wanted to do some, some kind of reading. We're gonna do Surah Al-Fatiha today, inshallah. We'll explain why. But I also wanted to go through some, um, some stuff together, inshallah, as the months kind of progress, um, inshallah. So one of the ideas that I had was to do like a book study. There's a book that I'm translating right now that I'm writing a commentary to. Hasn't been released, but I was maybe thinking we'd do it together here with like the notes that I have on it, inshallah. Um, and again, this will hopefully be, inshallah, monthly uh, once we finalize some details, inshallah. But I think that uh, we'll get started, inshallah, today with Surah Al-Fatiha, uh, in particular because it's something that everyone can connect to. Surah Al-Fatiha is the, uh, translates to the opener, or the opening, or the opener, and Typically, it's called the opener because it's the start of which book? The Quran. But it also is called the opener or the opening because it is something that creates openings for people, right, in their life, meaning the meaning of it. The understanding of this chapter is so profound. I want you to think of one thing. When you think of Surah Al-Fatiha, there's a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam where he says, لا صلاة إلا بفاتحة الكتاب that there's no prayer, uh, meaning a prayer is not accepted and there is no salah, except that part of that prayer, you have to recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Everything else in the prayer is really up to you in terms of the Qur'an that you read. You can decide how much you want to read, you can decide from which chapter. All of that is up to the person who's performing salah. But the one chapter where there is no like choice, where everybody has to engage in the recitation of that chapter is the Fatiha. Why do you think that is? Why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also make other chapters mandatory as well? Why is the only mandatory part of the Quran in the prayer the Fatiha? Why do you think that is? Or what reasons or what reflections do you have on that? I know everyone's afraid to like give the wrong answer. But reflections are, you can make reflections that are non-binding, right? That are just what, what, what that makes you think about it. What do you guys think? Yes. Okay, the importance behind the surah, very good. It's the only surah that if you pray the five prayers, in every rak'ah, you've, you've recited it 17 times. So you've, you've recited this thing seven, what else do we do 17 times a day, right? We don't, I mean, there are things that we, we don't even wash our hands that often, like 17 times a day? 17 times is a lot. And so the substance of this chapter is obviously something so critical that Allah would make you read it 17 times a day for as long as you live in your adult life until you pass away. And then, of course, you also have tarawih and sunnah prayers and stuff. So we're talking a very, very large amount of recitations, okay? So the meaning of it, as the sister said, what's your name? Farah. As Farah said, the meaning of it is probably significant, right? Because repetition is one of the signs of significance. If you, have you guys ever made biryani before? No? Come on, guys. How are you not going to make biryani, dude? What are you going to make for your guests when they come over? So when you're making biryani, there are some ingredients that are absolutely critical. And there are some ingredients that are like, if you don't have it, it's okay. It'll, you'll get by, right? So with biryani, you obviously need like, well, with every desi dish, right? You need garlic, onions, right? Tomato, what did you say? Yeah, curry, you need the actual spices, the masala, right? So you actually need that. You need biryani, you need rice. So if you're giving somebody the, the grocery list for biryani, 
you're going to repeat the really important parts. Make sure you get the garlic. Make sure you get the onions. And then you're like, okay, and then get the saffron while you're at it. And then they're like, okay, we'll get some saffron. You're like, but don't forget the onions and garlic. You're going to repeat it because it's so critical. And in the absence of the critical piece, the entire thing falls apart. So when it comes to Surah Al-Fatiha, the meaning of it is so critical that unless it's repeated frequently and often, it's entirely possible that a person would lose out on, this, on the significance of what the message of this chapter is saying. Okay, what else? What else comes to your mind when, we, when I say we recite it? Yeah. Good, yes. It's a reminder. We, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commands in the Quran that we should remind and be reminded because reminders benefit the believers. Reminders are, people oftentimes overlook reminders because it's something that you say, I already know this. But the reality about being reminded is that everyone knows what they're being reminded of. Nobody's ignorant of it. But there are temporary moments of forgetfulness where that information is not in the front of your mind, right? It drifts to the back. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in between your prayers, right? In between Fajr and in between Dhuhr. Fajr, you get oriented. Your compass is north. You're facing Allah. You're good. You finish reading your, your prayer and you feel Again, good, oriented towards Allah. And then what happens? You go to work, right? You scroll on TikTok. You have all these distractions coming at you one after another. And your purpose gets diluted. Your focus gets uh, 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 scrambled. And then what does Allah give you? He gives you dhuhr. And dhuhr then, a person goes, makes wudu, finds a place to pray. And they pray their dhuhr. And it reminds them. Between dhuhr and asr, same thing happens. You have a 3 p.m. meeting with your boss. You have a 4 p.m. this. You're looking on Grubhub to see what you can eat. All these things. And then you forget again. So then Asr and then Maghrib. And then before you go to sleep at night, you have Isha. So this regimen of prayer and recitation of this chapter is meant to recalibrate us, bring us back to our true north. Okay? Now, the Surah Al-Fatiha has, I kind of like the dark vibe, by the way. It's okay. No, it's fine. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, Surah Al-Fatiha has a, a few different names. And in the Quran, or in, in Arabic, I should say, there is a significance when it comes to names. When things have names, the more names they have, the more significant that thing is in Arabic culture. So there's a famous, uh, there's a famous sort of uh, fact that the, the, the lion, the animal, the lion, has over a hundred different words for it in the Arabic language. Okay? The heart has multiple words for it in the Arabic language. So the more word options you have in Arabic, the more significant the thing is. So Surah Al-Fatiha has many different names. Number one is Um Al-Quran, the mother of the book or the foundation of the book. This is because the entire Qur'an, Ibn al-Qayyim said this and others, the entire Qur'an can be summarized in Surah Al-Fatiha. In fact, one scholar said that all of revelation to any prophet in humanity from 144,000 prophets, as the hadith says, can be summarized in Surah Al-Fatiha. And even more specifically, he says in the verse, إِهْدِنَا أَصْغِرَاتَ mustaqim." So, this is the foundation of every message. If somebody wants to learn about Islam, if somebody wants to know, like, what's the thesis statement of your religion, Surah Al-Fatiha is a great place to start. It's a great summary of what the religion of Islam uh, 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 wants, wants for a Muslim person to think and to believe. Another name for this is Alhamd. It is called the praise because it is a chapter in which we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's one of the most beautiful ways of Allah ta'ala being praised. And also, Surah Al-Fatiha is actually a conversation between us and Allah. There's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says that when the person stands to pray and they recite Surah Al-Fatiha and they say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Allah ta'ala says, Hamadani Abdi, right? My servant has praised me. Ar Rahman Rahim. Allah Ta'ala and, and us, we have a dialogue. Now, we can't hear this dialogue, but we know that it's happening because the Prophet told us that. 
sallallahu alayhi wa So this dialogue is happening, and at the end of the dialogue, when we say, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْدُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَلْضَالِينَ Allah Ta'ala says that I will give my servant whatever they have asked for. So it is a beautiful dialogue that ends with the person who's reading getting the dua that they're making. It's also called as shifa the cure. Because according to the authentic narrations, how many of you, your parents have ever put their hand on your head when you had a headache and read Surah Al-Fatiha? You guys saw that TikTok where the cat had their, its paw? And it was like, right? So Surah Al-Fatiha is considered a cure, a literal cure. Meaning that it is a means in, by which Allah Ta'ala provides uh, relief and aid for people in their physical ailments. We believe that reading Surah Al-Fatiha on the part or on the place of pain or ailment is a means of shifa. It's also called a salah because it's a requirement for the daily prayers. Okay? The Prophet Wasallam he said that it's the single greatest chapter in the Quran. In a hadith that's narrated by Abu Sa'ad ibn al-Mu'alla, he says that, I will teach a surah. The Prophet ﷺ was talking to his companions in the masjid. I will teach a surah which is the greatest surah in the Qur'an. And he, he was announcing it. Then he took hold of my hand, Abu Sa'ad is saying this, and when he intended to leave the masjid, I asked him, Ya Rasulullah, you mentioned that you were going to teach me the greatest surah and now we're leaving. So he's kind of reminding him, Ya Rasulullah, did you, did you not say that? And the Prophet ﷺ said, oh yes. I will teach it to you. And he started, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. And he gave him Surah Al-Fatiha. So this one narration, the Prophet ﷺ gave it this title, that this is the greatest chapter in the Qur'an. Okay? It's also the only surah that was revealed by Allah to the Prophet ﷺ, not once, but twice. So every part of the Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ by the vehicle of the angel Jibreel. And Jibreel would give the Prophet ﷺ the revelation and then they would have a, 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 a teaching session where Jibreel would teach the Prophet ﷺ this revelation and then there would be an organization moment where Jibreel would give the Prophet ﷺ that this surah comes before this and goes before, or this passage goes here or goes here. Surah Al-Fatiha was the only passage in the Qur'an where this process was actually done two times, right? So this is a very, very noble uh, uh, virtue of Surah Al-Fatiha. So I don't, we can go on for all, all day, but I want to obviously get to the actual surah itself. It goes without saying that sitting down and spending an hour on a Saturday to invest some time into knowing what this surah is saying is critical. And it'll do so many things. Number one is that it'll attach your heart to the Qur'an. Number two is that it'll give you a sense of gratitude every time you read this chapter. And number three is that it'll make your prayer more meaningful. It'll make your prayer more substantive because now it's not just a matter of reading something I don't know. Now there's reflection going into it. So I wanted to go through this inshallah and hopefully by the end we have about an hour and a half from here. What we'll do is we'll go on for about 40 minutes. We'll go to 1040. Then we'll take about a five minute break. Let everyone stretch, get up get some water, some refreshments, there's coffee in the back, and then we'll come back and we'll hopefully finish, uh, inshallah. But this is going to be like a, 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 a discussion-based, engaging style. We're not going to just be lecturing for an hour and a half, inshallah. And we are going to be doing some group work, so don't get too comfortable. I know you're comfortable, inshallah, but don't get too comfortable. All right, what's the first, what's the first ayah in the surah? Who can read it? Hint, it's on the screen. What is it? Say it out loud. Very good. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is actually considered the first ayah in the surah by the majority of scholars. And it's the opening of the entire book. Now, this is going to be like a really, inshallah, uh oh. This is going to, okay, there we go. We're good. This is going to be, inshallah, hopefully something that gives you perspective. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, when the book was revealed, there was a chronological revelation. So we know that the first revelation was which surah? In the cave of Hira, which was the first word that came to the Prophet ﷺ? Iqra, okay? So chronologically, that was first. But when we talk about the tartib of the mushaf, the sequence of the book itself, this 
ordering was given to us by Allah. So I want us all to understand that. The ordering of the Quran was given to us by Allah, even if chronologically the revelation does not match up to that. There's a science called the, the Ulum al-Quran, and we go into that and explain the difference. But just knowing, number one, that Surah Al-Fatiha is in fact by design. Allah Ta'ala wanted Surah Al-Fatiha to be the opener of the book. Okay? Now, when you open up something, <laughs> you have to be introduced to it. When you meet someone for the first time, you have to be introduced. So what's the first thing you tell someone when you meet someone for the first time? Your name. Very good. So you're saying, hi, my, what's your name, by the way? Muhammad. So you say, my name is Muhammad. Right? W names are a big deal. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the reader of this book, is opening the book, and the first thing they're seeing is, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's introduction to whoever is reading this book. Now for us, for people who are attending here today, maybe we read Surah Al-Fatiha frequently, maybe it's, we've grown up with it perhaps, or even if we've converted to Islam, we have engaged with it enough. But I want you to think of like the first time someone's opening this, this book. And I want you to think of how incredible it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces himself. That this is Allah. This book is not written by a collective. It's not written by prophets. It's not written by genius people. No, this is by the creator of the heavens and the earth. The sustainer of all of creation. The master of the day of judgment. There's so many different descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could give in this moment. Because when you introduce yourself, Muhammad, I want you to tell me something more about yourself now. So I know your name, okay? So what else? Tell me more about yourself. Okay, I'm from California. Shocker. Okay, I'm from California. And give me one more thing. You're Egyptian. All right. Um dunya, ahsan nas, mashallah. Okay? So listen to this. My name is Muhammad. I'm from California and I'm Egyptian. When people introduce themselves, they typically tell you the things that they want you to know about them. Right? Muhammad, what's one of your what's one of your flaws? Public speaking. So why didn't you introduce yourself by saying, hey, my name is Muhammad and I'm not a good public speaker? Or I struggle with that. Why did you not do that? <laughs> yeah, and you'll get better, inshallah, because you're Egyptian and you talk with your hands, right? Egyptian. So, but there's a, there's a philosophy here. Listen to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces himself and then he tells you the things that he wants you to remember about him always. He could have told you, now Allah doesn't have any vulnerabilities or weaknesses, so that example doesn't translate one-to-one, -one, but Allah could have started by saying that I am Allah and I am the one who will punish with the fire of hell. And it would have been true. It would have been true. I am Allah and I am the most just. And that's true. I am Allah and I am the most wise. That's true. I am Allah and I am the creator. That's true. There is an endless amount of descriptions that Allah could have begun the Quran with that would have been true. But which ones did he choose? Isn't that incredible? Like when you meet someone, okay, I'm about to, I'm about to step on a plane, inshallah, in, in, in two hours. And I try to get my AirPods in as, as, as soon as I can. Because my job in life is to talk. So whenever I have time not to talk, I don't want to talk. So I sit on the plane and I try to get my AirPods in and then the person next to me is like, I'm like, and I take the, you take the AirPod out just like two inches because you don't want them to think that you're committing to a conversation. So you're like, yeah. And they're like, what's going on? Where are you going today? I'm like, we're all going to the same place. That's why we're on this plane. You know, I'm going to Dallas. Oh, final destination? I'm like, are, do you work for the CIA? Like, what, this is a really bad disguise, you know? And when you meet someone, like, what's your name, right? And then you tell them. So I, my name is Abdul Rahman. Oh, okay, interesting. Well, tell me more about yourself. I would start to tell you the things that I wanted you to remember. Like if we left, if we never spoke again, what are the things that I want you to remember about me and want you to associate with me to the point where when you think of me, you only think of these things. 
And like I said, Allah Ta'ala could have chosen anything, but he chose this. It's remarkable. How can anyone think of Allah except that he's merciful? How can anyone think of Allah? And then we have other narrations, other ahadith that support this very clearly. Inna rahmati taghlibu ghadabi. Allah says himself, my mercy overdoes, overcomes my wrath. Allah Ta'ala could have said, I am the strongest in punishment, shadidul akhab. But he didn't say that. He said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So let's go ahead and explore this a little bit now. Okay? So we have Allah's name, and we have the, 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 the letter Ba here. You see this letter Ba. So Bism, right? Bismi. Bismi Allahi ar-Rahmani ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. That Ba, actually in Arabic, there's, uh, if you look in the tafsir, they say that there's 17 or 19 different meanings for the letter Ba. So if you open up a book, you can see there's like ba ma'iyya, ba sababiyya, ba this, ba, you know, all these different kinds of ba's. So they say that this ba could be translated many different ways, which again is part of the amazing, miraculous nature of the Quran is that there's multiple meanings produced. The more that you know the language, the more that you know the actual tafsir, there's multiple meanings. But we're going to settle on one meaning today, which is kind of comprehensive, which is... Allah begins the person's journey. The Quran is meant to introduce a person to the purpose of their life, why they're here, their existence. It's a book of guidance. And Allah begins that person's journey by reminding that person it is only possible with Allah. Everything you do is only possible with Allah. Even things that you think you do, and you do out of necessity. For One of them is eating. What are we supposed to say before we eat? Bismillah. Why do we say Bismillah before we eat? Because the Ummah is trying to starve shaitan. Why do we say Bismillah before we eat? Good. Huh? A moment of gratitude. What's your name? Urbaid, mashallah. Yeah, a moment of gratitude. Very good. Absolutely. What else? Where... The, Recognizing where the food came from. How about this? Also realizing that at multiple levels, this moment is not possible without Allah. So you're sitting here and you're sitting in front of, what's your favorite food, Obeid? Biryani, wow, mashallah, we're hitting the court together, right? <laughs> you and me, right? Where are we going after this? <laughs> so you're sitting there in front of this beautiful plate of biryani or you got a burger or you got you know, tacos, whatever you want, right? It's kind of early, I know. A bagel, anything you like, and you say bismillah, and in that moment, you think to yourself, what did it take for this to get here? Now, we can go a couple different directions with this. You can go down the supply chain route, and you could understand the complexity and the work and the nuance and the organization that it took for all of the people that produced the ingredients, the farmers, the ranchers, right? Those who produce the yogurt, the rice, the grain, the vegetables, the meat, everything to work in harmony and in concert to come together. The supply chain effort to deliver those things so that they don't spoil. Forget that, sorry. The fertilization of the earth. I mean, how far do you want to go back? The rain coming from the sky, right? Allowing the earth to be fertile enough to produce these things that are required. And then the farmer being able to harvest and yield this from the earth without being destroyed by pests. And then the supply chain effort to bring that to the merchants. And then the merchants, the wholesalers, sell it to the stores. And then the stores sell it to you. And somehow, in all of that, it's still good. And then it goes to the restaurants who prepare the dish. And then you go and, you, and we sit there and we just say, I just want one plate of biryani. And it comes out and we haven't done the math to realize how Allah facilitated all of that so we could have that food. And if one thing went wrong, if one thing went wrong, the entire process would not deliver that to us. If the crops went bad that, that year, that season, then your biryani's not gonna have that. If the truck that was driving tomatoes, right? If the truck dis disconnected in the trailer 
exploded and you had tomatoes everywhere, which happens sometimes randomly in this country for some reason. There goes your butter chicken, man. Right? And we don't think about, subhanAllah, how Allah was a part of that entire process. He facilitated every second of it. And if the earth did not produce enough rain, if, if the, if the, if the, uh, uh, if the, uh, uh, the process that the earth has to produce rain did not produce enough rain, then you would not have the vegetation necessary or the animals themselves would not have their food. Okay, so that's part number one. Now, when you sit there in front of your food, it's hard to kind of go down, you know, that list. But I want us all to think about that. Now, the second part, how many people in this room have ever had like a GI bug before? Like a stomach bug. Okay. So what guarantee do you have? What guarantee do you have ever in your life that you're going to be able to enjoy food? Is this something that you just like demand from God? I deserve this. There's, a, there, there's an organism that can exist that is microscopic, cannot be seen by the naked eye, that if someone, so, I'm not trying to scare you, but if someone so much as shakes your hand and then you put a piece of gum in your mouth with that same hand, I'm not trying to create like paranoid people, but this is just the nature of the universe, okay? If you open a door and then you go and you take a bite of, of that morsel of food with that same hand and maybe you didn't wash or whatever, or somebody coughs or some kid. There's so many ways, right? There's so many ways. I think what COVID did to us, unfortunately, is it made us all like detectives. I got COVID. Who was it, right? And we start like, it's almost like Clue. We're like, we're putting the cards down, trying to figure out it was my aunt. The reality is that illness and sickness are destined to us by Allah. And there's no point sometimes in trying to trace back and figure out who gave it to you, right? But back to the point. The GI bug that could exist inside of you can make your body literally reject the food that you want to enjoy. You'll be laying there in bed sick with food poisoning or with that stomach bug and you will be vomiting everything that you try to put in your body, even if it's water. So now we sit down and we have a bottle of water, we have coffee, we have this. Now we know the meaning of Bismillah. We say Bismillah before we eat because we realize that whether it's the process or whether it's the actual consumption, it's not possible without Allah. You want to know how amazing Abu Bakr as-Siddiq was? The Prophet Sallallahu best friend, the second Khalifa, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an, we say Bismillah once before we eat, right? That's what's, that's what's mandatory is to say Bismillah before you eat one time. Abu Bakr was so cognizant of how Allah was present in every moment that he would say Bismillah before every bite, before every sip. So he would take a bite and he would say Bismillah, he would eat it. And then he would put, and then he would take another bite, Bismillah, and he would eat it. Because he was so aware that every single morsel was in fact given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just use food because it's, it's an easy topic and it's something that we can all relate to. But I want you to understand that this entire exercise can be applied to literally everything that we do in our lives. Everything. That's why the believer always begins with Bismillah. Whatever we do, we wake up, Bismillah. We get in the car, Bismillah. What kind of assumption do you have that you're going to make it to your destination? Bismillah, right? So this statement is very powerful. In the name of Allah. Without Allah, it's not possible. Without Allah, my body, my capacity, the facilitation is not possible. And so I am constantly reminding myself to become this person who exists in a state of humility and gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That none of this world is possible without him. Okay? And then, like I said with Muhammad, who's the Egyptian, who's the California, who's from Egypt, Californian, who's from Egypt originally. Allah introduces himself with two beautiful words, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. He is the one who is Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahman, the scholars try to figure out, based on the, the, the linguistic breakdown, what the more accurate definitions of these words are. Because they both come from the root word, Rahma, which means mercy. So you don't want to say, in the name of Allah, the merciful, the merciful. Because that doesn't give enough distinction to the Arabic. So what 
did the scholars say these two words mean and what are their differences? Well, Rahman is the breadth of Allah Ta'ala's mercy. That Allah's mercy extends to everything in some way, shape, or form. Even the person that denies God's existence, Allah has given them the ability and the air to breathe to say that statement. If a person says, I don't believe in God, Allah gave them the ability to say that. That's mercy. Every single creation on earth is receiving God's mercy to some degree at some point in some time. Constantly. So Ar-Rahman means the one who, his mercy, everyone is touched by it. It's like oxygen. Everyone is engaged by oxygen. Every single creation. Ar-Rahim, they say, is the one who, his mercy is the highest qualitative level. Like no one can outdo Allah Ta'ala's mercy. We have no example of Allah Ta'ala's mercy. The Prophet Sallallahu would just give as many emthal, as many uh, uh, sim, you know, similitudes as he, as he could to try to exemplify. The one in particular that's very beautiful is there was one time a mother who lost her child. And I don't know if you guys have ever like, anyone here a, ch- a parent of a child or children? When you lose your child temporarily, it happens to the best of us, right? You're somewhere and your kid just leaves and you look and... This actually happened last year to me, subhanAllah. Like, I still get goosebumps thinking about it. Uh, we were visiting a place. We were on the beach. My son was sitting in the water playing in the sand. And I looked down, and maybe for like a minute, I looked up, and all of a sudden, he was gone. And I go running, and my wife and I go running. And it was like, it must have been like three minutes where we couldn't find him. But I, wallahi, it felt like three hours. Screaming his name, looking for him. The entire beach was helping. The lifeguards went out. No one knew where he was. And... Our friends were there. They were running around. It was, it was chaos. It was absolute chaos. And it just so happened that the tide was moving side by side. And so when I looked down for that minute, the tide just kind of pushed him to the side. And by the time he looked up from playing, he didn't see us. And so he walked to go look for us. Alhamdulillah, we were able to find him. And when I saw him, I just like hugged him and, you know, embraced him and was trying to sort of not scare him with my emotions, but I was like holding him tight. This happened in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu A mother lost her child and they looked for the child. They couldn't find the child. Finally, finally, they found the child. And when the child was found, the mother embraced the child and hugged the child and held her close. And the Prophet Sallallahu was sitting there and all the companions were, were a part of the search party. They all helped in the rescue of the child. And the Prophet Sallallahu he used that moment and he talked to the companions and he said, do you see how much this mother loves her child? Like the mom is crying, the kid is crying. They're like, they, they, they won't, they're, they're, you know, tied together now. And the companion said, yes, yes, Ya Rasulullah, look at this, you know, subhanAllah. And he said, do you ever think that this mother, after this experience, would just take her child and drop her child into a pit of fire? And the companions were like, of course not. After what we saw, there's no doubt. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah loves his servants more than this mother even loves her child. <laughs> do you think he just, do you think he wants to put anybody in the fire? Do you think that's something that makes Allah happy? No. Right? That's the, the quality, and the Prophet Sallallahu his mercy is even greater, but the quality of his mercy is so great that the best example that we can fathom as human beings is like a mother with her child or a father with his child, right? That's the highest level of mercy we can even imagine. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, compared to Allah, that mercy is actually zero. Because anything over infinity in math is what? Come on, California, tech giant. Anything over infinity is what? Is zero. Any number over infinity is nothing because it's all relative, right? So the mother's mercy, even if it's 100, if it's over infinity, it's zero. Allah's mercy will always be infinitely greater than any mercy we can experience. Okay. We just spent 20 minutes talking about Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. How long do we take to... to pray our prayers? 
three minutes. Could you imagine if we started Salah, Allah Akbar, Subhanakallah, bihamdika, wa tabarak asmaka, wa ta'ala jadda, wa la ilaha gharik, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Can you imagine if we just stopped and thought about everything we just talked about in the Salah, how meaningful it would become? This is the goal for today. We're going to try to do a walkthrough of this in this way, inshallah, so that by the end of it, so every ayah of the Fatiha has a layer of meaning for us. But I want to hear from you. What reflections do you have from the Basmala? What do you think about when you see this ayah or when you read this ayah? What comes to your mind? Because I'm only sharing with you what I've read and what I've thought about, but I want to hear from you. You probably know more than I do. Bismillah. Yeah, beautiful. She said that these two qualities are the qualities that Allah introduced himself with. And obviously, he could have introduced himself with anything, but these are the two qualities. And so obviously, these two qualities are, are important, not just for us to realize that Allah is these things, but for us to also have these traits with others. The, the, the Prophet Sallallahu said, Irhamu man fil ard, yarhamakum man fil sama. That have mercy with those on the earth, and the one who is in the heavens will have mercy with you. Mercy is this incredible experience that actually, it's almost like a flywheel. When a person is merciful, then they experience more mercy. And they experience more mercy in many different ways. So if a person feels like they're not experiencing mercy in their life, one of the things they have to ask themselves is, how merciful am I? If I'm not being merciful, then how am I going to be somebody that is able to Receive mercy. Allah, the, the Prophet ﷺ said, Man la yarham, la yurham. Whoever doesn't display mercy will not receive mercy. From people, of course, but also from Allah. And so, absolutely. If Allah is using that opportunity in the Basmara to give us the two traits that He wants us to remember Him by, then it means that these traits are so critical for us to also exemplify. Very good. Anyone else? That's a great reflection. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. When you make du'a, Shashishta, when she makes du'a, she tries, to, she uses the names of Allah that are affiliated with that du'a. So if you're asking, for example, for like a job, you might use ar-razaq. Or if you're asking Allah Ta'ala for, you know, to give you wisdom, you might call him by al-hakim. But in this, it's almost like Allah is preparing us to read, and I'll actually, I'll actually join you on this and piggyback off your point. It's not just Allah preparing us for the Fatiha, but the entire Qur'an has to be read in the context of mercy. The entire Qur'an. So even the verses on punishment have to be read against this backdrop of mercy. Okay? The, only, the example that comes to mind for me is my dad. My dad, Jim Murphy, okay, converted to Islam in like 1970-something. I forget exactly when. My dad is like the most chill, relaxed guy I've ever met in my life. He like never yells, never gets upset. Like it's super rare. My mom is Egyptian. So, <laughs> maybe that's all you need to know. So, no, and Egyptians are very passionate, right? Egyptians speak with their hands. They say that if you want an Egyptian to be quiet, you handcuff them. And they won't know how to talk, right? So Egyptians are very passionate. There's really no, there's really, it's very difficult. Sheikh Atif is perhaps the only Egyptian I know who's very balanced. And, and Ustad Hassan. Sheikh Hassan, right? He's Egyptian as well. 
Yeah, there's something about the two of them, mashallah. Look, Allah brought them together. And <laughs> but the only, like, if you meet average Egyptian people, like, we're very passionate, right? It's, it's, it's the way that Allah Ta'ala, you know, the hot blood, maybe. I don't know. So, and I'm, I'm also half Egyptian, so I'm guilty for this. So my mother is always yelling. Not, not in a, you know, not in a bad way, you know, maybe sometimes, but not in a bad way. But always, right, she's feeling it. My dad on the other side is never yelling. So as children, there were five of us. As children, you know, there was the moment where you get in trouble and then you sort of retreat back to like your bedroom and maybe it's next to your siblings and, and they would come in and they would stand at the door and they'd be like, what'd you do? You know, and you kind of have the debrief, you know, and the older sibling is telling you how to get through it and the younger sibling is standing there scared and so everyone's just kind of... So with my mom, the, the yelling was so common, right, uh, that there was really no credence given to her anger. Like when she got upset, everyone's like, here we go again, you know, because it was so common. With my dad, whenever he got angry, the people who were the most upset were the siblings. How dare you make dad upset? I remember if, if we ever got my dad upset, my older brother would come and, and sister would say, hey, what are you doing? Like that, that guy never gets angry. How could you make him mad? Like with mom, we get it. You know, her love, but moms are different. They'll yell at you as they're making you your favorite food. Right, you're worthless. Do <laughs> you want ketchup with this or no? Habibi. Yahmari, Habibi Hamar, right? My beloved donkey, right? That's, moms are different. But when my dad, who was so even keel, would get upset, forget, forget my mom. My, my siblings would be like, you are the worst. You made him upset? How is that possible? Now, I know I see some people in here now that are like, what was that like having a dad that never got upset? But... When I think of Allah, of course, with Allah al-Mathil A'la, Allah's example is, is infinitely greater. So now when you read the verses of consequence in the Quran, we have to read it like that. Really? You're going to displease Allah, the one who will forgive anything? How? How can you do that? How did you accomplish displeasing Allah when he will forgive you the moment your heart feels regret? How is it possible? You know, you, there, I'm going to say this very carefully. There are some collections and some chapters in the books of Hadith. Go to Riyadh al-Salihin. Go to the last chapter. It's called the Book of Forgiveness. The chapter on repentance. Read that chapter of Ahadith. And I want you to, at the end of it, you're going to be like, how is it possible anyone's going to hell? Because you go through these narrations and you're like, there's no way. Allah will forgive anybody as long as they come to him. That's it. I mean, the story of the, the, story of the woman who, you know, was, uh, uh, would sell her body and then she feeds an animal, right, that's starving in the desert, Allah forgives her. What? The story of the, the man who struggles with alcohol, he comes to Asr prayer, he prays, Allah forgives him. The man who fornicated in the market uh, 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 in Medina, he met a woman and he fornicated. And then he came to the prophet and he says, oh, Allah, forg Allah forgave him. Like, you have these narrations and you're like, how is it possible that anyone is going to die without saying, oh, Allah, forgive me? Right? So here's the, here's the, the kicker before we move to the next ayah. One of the great tragedies in, in our ummah is that people have introduced Allah in ways other than this. And, and I'm not some compassionate imam. You know, this is a new pejorative that they use. Oh, this imam is not strong. He's weak. He's compassionate. I'm like, that's actually a compliment. I'm not introducing Allah any differently than he introduced himself. I mean, literally, it's the first ayah in the book. So I don't know which Allah the angry people are talking about. But when I opened the Quran, this is the first verse I saw. Do you get what I'm saying? But how many of us were introduced to Allah this way? 
Can you imagine as kids, if we were introduced to Allah, that he will forgive you and that he wants to forgive you. He loves you so much that he will forgive you the moment that your heart feels remorse, you're forgiven. All you have to do is try. All you have to do is put forth some effort. It's a tragedy that people have introduced Allah in a way that he didn't introduce himself. And we wonder why so many people struggle in their relationship with Allah. Maybe it's because they never were introduced in the right way. Their relationship got off on the wrong foot. Right? Like if Muhammad, if I met him for the first time and he said, I hate people who live in Dallas. I would say, okay, well, this relationship is not going to go very far, right? But if Muhammad said, my name is Muhammad, and I always love giving people from Dallas a chance, then, okay, we're going to be in a good spot, right? So Allah Ta'ala wanted to introduce himself like this to us. Azza wa Jal. Okay. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This is the next verse. Allah Ta'ala teaches us this statement because this is the statement that is probably, besides the basmala, should be the most repeated statement that we have. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Everyone say Alhamdulillah. We should always say Alhamdulillah. Even in times of goodness, in times of difficulty, right? Uh, Imam Tahawi has a really beautiful line in his Aqidah book where he says that we thank Allah in the good times and the bad, in the sweet times and in the, sour, in the bitter you know, we thank Allah even in the bitter times. We thank him because it could have been worse. We thank him because we trust his wisdom. We thank him because he's preparing us for something. Like yesterday's khutbah, I was trying to, was trying to give us a perspective on tests. We say, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. That all praise and thanks. Hamd is the two of those things put together. We praise Allah because he deserves to be praised. No one else can accomplish what Allah Ta'ala can accomplish. Nobody else can accomplish what Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala can accomplish. Can you, anyone in here a photographer? Yeah, we have one, okay, mashallah. Anyone else? No? Anyone here ever tried to take a picture? Okay, there you go, that's better. How many of you have seen something beautiful and try to take a picture of it with your phone, only to be disappointed. So you're looking at something, you're like, oh my God. And you take out your phone, you're like, and then you look and you're like, and then you compare and you're like, this sucks. Right? This is the best that we can come up with. And even if you have those lenses that are $10,000, $20,000 lenses, it still can't match the human eye. Like, would you go and meet with the Zeiss family and have them replace your eyes with one of their lenses? No, no one would ever do that, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation of the human eye is something that we are chasing. Like, developers are chasing, trying to replicate the ability to capture light in the way that the human eye can. And the best we can do is filters, the best we can do is take a picture and then edit it for an hour to get it somewhat beautiful and then we say, here we go. But it still did not match what we saw with the eye. The ear, subhanAllah, there are people that, audiologists and people who are perfecting sound, they're coming in and they're trying to make spaces sound clear. This microphone is only as valuable as it replicates and that it projects accurately my real voice. If it distorted my voice, if it made it sound harsh, if it made it sound too sharp or too dull, they would say, take this microphone away. Human beings at the height of technology are trying, this is kind of what Imam Zaid was saying last night, are trying to replicate what Allah has embedded in our created state. Like you are the most sophisticated thing. You're more impressive than Tesla. I swear, I still don't trust that stuff with my life, man. I get into a car and the guy is looking at me and he's like, what's going on? I'm like, put your hands on the wheel, All right? <laughs> don't, don't, what's going on, me? Drive, right? You are more sophisticated and complex and intelligent and strategically thought out than any created, uh, uh, any manufactured item is the human being. 
So we praise Allah because in and even in that creation, it did not take any time. It did not create it did not create labor for Allah. Allah Ta'ala said, Kun fayakun. He said, be and it was. The existence of the ecosystem, the environment, the delicate balance, the fact that the moon is exactly the right distance away from the earth to create tide that is generated on the oceans so that ships can sail. And if it were any further away, there would be no waves. If it were any closer, we would have constant tsunamis. You know, anyone who's a specialist in their field, I feel like there's a layer of depth that you go into that when you go into that depth, the only thing you say is subhanAllah. When I meet like students who are studying you know, medicine and they're studying anatomy, they're like, this does not make sense. How could this have been accidental? How? When they study the, the delicate nature of how all of the, 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 the biological uh, uh, you know, organisms interact with each other to, to sustain an ecosystem that is, that is livable, they say subhanAllah. So we praise Allah because there is simply no conception of perfection like God. رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَ سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا ذَا بَنَّارٍ We say, oh Allah, there's no way you created all of this for no reason. And by the way, I'm going to pause here for a second. Being in Southern California is interesting. You have a very interesting dynamic. Because you live in a place that literally people vacation to, to see the natural beauty of Allah's creation. This is where you live. You live 20 minutes from the beach. Is that how far we are? Okay. You live in a place where you're 20 minutes from being able to reflect on the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite knowledge and wisdom and beauty, but you also live in a place where society is trying its hardest to make you look the other way. With brands and with shiny things and with cars. I mean, there's more Teslas here than people. I don't know how that works, you know? (laughs) And I was reflecting on this last night as I was driving home And I was thinking to myself, how hard we try to find beauty in creative things when the creation is the hidden beauty that will never be outdone. There's more pictures of sunsets than there are Model Xs. There's more pictures of oceans and coastlines than there are beautiful houses. There's no doubt that Allah has given human minds the ability to come up with incredible things. Buildings and infrastructure and technology, these are incredible. But all of these pale in comparison to who Allah is. Because they are, like I said yesterday, we should not fall in love with the things that we see because all of those things are only made possible by the unseen. We say alhamdulillah. All praise and thanks is to Allah for the breath that we just took, for the blink that we just had. The fact that if you couldn't blink, your eye would become so irritated by dryness that it would, it would drive you crazy. Have any, has anyone here ever had a migraine before or a headache? I had a migraine on Thursday night. And the first thing I think to myself when I have a migraine is, why didn't I thank Allah for the non-migraine days? You know, I'm thinking, I'm like, subhanAllah, what I would give, what I would give to have this pain go away. Has anyone here ever pulled a muscle on their back? It's usually in like some weird way. It's not deadlifting. It's not, nothing big time. It's like getting cookies out of the oven. It's like some pointless thing, picking up the remote. You're like, oh, right? And then for the next seven days, you're in like an acute inflammatory state. You can't even breathe. You can't even brush your teeth. You have to like brush your teeth holding onto the counter, right? At 25, at 30, you're like, I can't, I can't bend over. We say alhamdulillah for the times that we're healthy and the times that we are not, right? Now, here's an amazing part. 
as this verse goes on, it gets more impressive. Alhamdulillah. Wow. Okay, so we thank and praise Allah for everything. Even the things that we don't recognize. When you make dua, say, oh Allah, I praise you and thank you for the things I know and the things I don't know. Because there are many things I don't know. Rabb means the one who takes care of. The one, we say sustainer, the Lord. The one who is in charge and takes care of everything in, that, in, its, in its domain. So when they say, Rabbul Bayt, the Lord of the house, that's the person who's in charge of making sure that everything is good. The house is good, everything's good. Okay? But who is Allah the Rabb of? Al-Alameen. Allah is the Lord of Alam means world. Alameen means worlds. This isn't talking about extraterrestrial life. Maybe it is. This is talking about how many worlds of organisms exist in our world. Allah takes care of every single one of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord and sustainer and caretaker of every single one of them. And he does it flawlessly. Now let me bring up a common contention. Are you ready for this? Let's go to reddit.com briefly, okay? So a common contention. How is it possible that Allah calls himself Rabbul Alameen when there are people out there who are starving? When there are people who are, who don't have homes? When there are people who are not being taken care of? Hold on just one second. Is there enough food in the world for everybody? Yes or no? Let me ask that in a different way. Do we throw away food? Okay. Is there enough space on the earth for people to have a place to live? Okay. Is there enough ability and capacity to provide welfare and health care for those people who need it? Absolutely. Where is the bottleneck? Very good. How dare, how dare a person take their own obstruction of something and blame it on the creator? I can't believe in God. Why? Because people are starving. Wait a second. You had six animals for dinner. You had chicken and beef and lamb and shrimp and salmon. Did you just say it's God's fault that people are starving? How dare a person make that claim against Allah that he did not provide enough? The only thing that is stopping people from having what they need is people. Why is there tragedy and crisis in the world? Because of the choices that people make. This is the, this is the source of it. So if we talk about Allah Ta'ala's caretaking of the universe... We better not confuse that with our responsibility and role as those who Allah Ta'ala inni ja'ilu fil ardi khalifa. Allah Ta'ala has created human beings to be those people that are the responsible parties to make sure that we do not get in the way of the harmony that he created. That we support and that we don't obstruct. That we make sure that we facilitate and that we don't block. We ask Allah Ta'ala to forgive us. So, Allah Ta'ala here is saying that every single living creature, creation, organism, animate or inanimate, is supported by and facilitated by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Anyone have anything they want to share on this verse? We'll take a break right now, inshallah. Anyone have anything that comes to their mind when they think of Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen? Yes. Yeah. How old's your son? 18. Okay, yeah, this is, okay. I thought it was like my son who's six, and you're like, well, Mario and Bowser. Okay, Bowser's bad. And you have to like go down. But 18, there's a little bit, you can get a little bit more conceptual, okay? So the book that I'm, okay, so this just convinced me now. So the, when I come, inshallah, every month, we're going to do Surat al-Fatiha today, but I want to do, uh, there's a book that I'm translating that I haven't published yet. It's called Fawa'id al-Balwa wal Mahan. It's, by, it's called The Virtues of Trial and Tribulation. The Benefits of Trial and Tribulation. Izzuddin bin Abdul Salam. Izzuddin bin Abdul Salam. 
But it's a very so I want to tell you right now it's not a shar. It's a very it's a very quick book. It's like 17 points. He doesn't go into detail. That's why I'm com- I'm translating and I'm adding stuff. Not I'm I'm not adding stuff for all. I'm 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 uh, I'm taking from other books by other authors and I'm putting it in this. I'm like a glorified compiler, not even. Uh, I'm like assembling the plate, okay? I didn't I didn't write anything original in there. So he writes this book and he talks about why bad things exist. And if Allah is all good and all powerful, why would he let these things happen? Okay? There is there is an overwhelming answer to this question that can be talked about for like a long time but the short answer that I'll give is that we only know that something is bad in the absence of good that can come from that thing but as soon as something good comes from that thing the thing that was bad also becomes good a car accident for example a person gets into a car wreck and their car is totaled. That's a bad thing. There's no doubt that that, that is something that you and I would not want to happen, correct? Inshallah, we don't, no one wants to get into a car accident. But let's assume it happens and the person is safe and they walk away unhurt, alhamdulillah, and they leave and then a few weeks later they get a check from their insurance company for more than the value of the car based on what the insurance company evaluated it as. And now they're able to buy a brand new car, a very nice one. Their old one was squeaking and creaking and making all kinds of noise. It had this weird smell when they spilled masala one time in it. And, and now they get, and, and wow, I got a brand new car. All for a couple weeks of taking Uber here and there, or renting a car, this and that, not having my own car. Sounds like a pretty sweet deal. How many of you guys would, if you could guarantee you wouldn't be injured, you get a brand new car in six weeks, how many of you guys would take that? Oh, interesting. You're raising your hand because you want to get into a car accident? You sadistic people? See, the thing is, human beings are so short-sighted. Imam Ghazali says this. Imam Ghazali says, actually, I love him, man. You know, there's certain people in Jannah you want to meet. Obviously, all the prophets and the Sahaba. But Imam Ghazali is one of those people I can't wait to meet. Because I just feel like he, I feel like he was like, he, he wrote things that like never went out of style. So one of the things he wrote was he said, human beings only complain about Allah's qadr when it's something they don't like. But no one ever gets something good and is like, God, why me? He's like, why are you being unfair? When something good happens to you, you should scream at the heavens. Right? He says, you're being unfair because you're only challenging Allah when it's something you don't want. But why not challenge Allah at everything? Wouldn't that be more honest? So he's saying, really, it's not Allah's problem, it's your problem. Allah is destining things for you or in, for someone that at the moment is not very good, right? I mean, Michael Jordan's famous story, Michael Jordan, right, the best basketball player to have ever lived, what was his famous story? He got cut from his high school basketball team. I'm sure that that was a really bad day for him. And then that maybe fueled him to become the best basketball player that ever lived. Right? I know it's sensitive because this is L.A. And you have not only one but two now people that have played for your team that you guys argue have been better. But that's just six NBA finals. It's okay. One day you'll get past the Nuggets, inshallah. Okay? So the point being is that these bad things are only bad when we remove the context of what they provide and what they bring, right? So maybe somebody who was bullied in school, it's a bad thing. But subhanAllah, through that experience, when that person who was picked on sees now somebody else going through that, who's younger than them, what can they do for that person? Yeah, I'll tell you a story. This is real. I was, I was the book that I'm translating for the Balu al Mahan. I, I, I was, re, I was reading, I was teaching it one weekend at a masjid in Chicago, and I was reading from my notes, and uh, 
this story gets me emotional because it's so crazy how it happened. There's a very good friend of mine. Uh, he's a doctor and he's like very successful, mashallah, in his in his in his medical uh, career. Uh, he's the head of critical care at like one of the one of the best hospitals in Chicago. And his first daughter, when she was I think ten years old, was diagnosed with a disease similar to ALS. And she spent the next three years basically passing away. And when she was 13, she, she finally passed. May Allah have mercy on her. And he's, a, he's not only her father, he's a physician, so he knows acutely, very, very aware of what's happening. He, he, he's read all the journals, knows all the data. He's able to pinpoint every moment of her deterioration to a day. And he's watching his daughter die. And it's his eldest daughter. And he can do nothing. So she passes away when she was 13. I remember this because I was young when we went to her janazah. Um, I was, I think, in college. Now, fast forward 10 years. It's been 10 years since she passed. She would have been 23 this year. I was teaching in his masjid and I was teaching this book. And I knew when I saw him sitting there that he was thinking of his daughter, Bayan. Because, of course, that's the tragedy of his life. He says he thinks about her every day. He says, I'm not, I'm not, he goes, I, I don't want to die like that, but I'm excited for my life to end because I'll be with her. That's what he says. And, uh, man, it's So <clears throat> I'm reading this book <clears throat> and one of the points that <clears throat> the author makes, <clears throat> sorry, if I come here every month, you're going to see me cry once a month for sure. The point that the author makes is he says that some tragedies happen to people and in the midst of that tragedy, you now become a mercy for others. And I read that point, and I read it very, I read it just very, you know, I said, you know, you become rahmah now. Allah Ta'ala has, has, has given you this test, and you've gone through it, and now you become a, a mercy for other people. And when I said that, he's sitting like right, like right where Obeid's sitting. He was like that close. I just saw him cry, and I was like, that's weird. And it's, it's a crowd, so I didn't ask him, like, why are you crying? After the session, He's like, can I drive you home? I said, yeah, sure, because it's Chicago. My parents live in Chicago. So when I was visiting, he's like, let me drive you to your parents' house. I said, sure. So we're driving, and he says to me, he goes, you know, for, for 10 years, he goes, I still pray. I still love Allah. I'm still very, like, Muslim. But he goes, for 10 years, I always wondered why Allah did this to me. And he goes, it was just, it was just like a... <laughs> a nagging voice in my head that I could never get rid of. And he goes, I would just ignore it. But I kept thinking, why would Allah do this to me? Why would Allah do this to me? Like, what did I do wrong? And he said, when you read that point tonight, he goes, I thought now of something that happens to me almost every week in the hospital. I said, what happens? He said, in the hospital, because he's in the ICU, he's in critical care, so he's in the ICU. So he said, when, I, when there is a, a family that has been told that their child is likely only has a few more hours or days to live, he said they, they, the, the parents, their response, of course, is a certain way. They're hysteric or they're angry. Or they're, and, and he goes, it's understandable. And he goes, and the nurses and the staff, they don't know how to handle it. And nothing they say works. And, the, and, and, and they're being yelled at by the parents. You know, you didn't try everything. Get out of here. Like, yell, you know, all this stuff. Of course, it's their baby. Like, you know what I mean? And so he said, they started paging me, Dr. Hisham. Please come to the, this floor, this, this room. And he said, in the beginning, I, I didn't know why they were paging me. Because he goes, I only work with certain cases. I don't work with all cases. 
And he said that they told me that this person has been told that their, that their child is going to pass away. <clears throat> and he said, I walk in the room and they look at me and they've never seen me before because I'm not their doctor. And he says, the first thing I say to them is, or, hello, my name is Dr. Hisham Hasaballah. Ten years ago, my daughter passed away when she was 13. And he says, the moms and the dads just break down and hug me. And we sit there and we talk. And I just tell them that I've been through this and I know what you're going, and, and it sucks and it's the worst and this and that. And he goes, and we cry. And then I leave and he goes, and the parents are, they're not better, of course, but at least there's, a, there's an equilibrium. There's a homeostasis that's been read. And he said, maybe, <laughs> this line, man, it's, it gets me. He said, maybe Allah took her so that she could be a mercy for all these parents. He said, my daughter was always so merciful. Maybe Allah took her so that she could be mercy <laughs> for all these parents. Sorry. <clears throat> so the point I'm trying to make to answer your question, Allah took her so that these parents could have mercy in their heart. Like Bayan's, Bayan's legacy is going on in the hearts of these parents now and giving them some sense of relief. And he said that that's exactly who my daughter was. You know, all the parents loved her when she was alive and she's still bringing them something even in her passing, right? May Allah have mercy on her and make it easy for Hisham and also all parents who are struggling with that. So to answer your question, I did not think that this is where we were going with this. To answer your question, why does Allah let these things happen is like a very, very complex question. But the answer is there's more than meets the eye. There's always more than meets the eye. You know, the angels, the angels asked, are you going to make human beings, oh Allah? You know, you're going to make them and they're going to spread corruption and spill blood and they're going to fight and create war and cause havoc. The angels knew. I mean, the angels, they were spot on. You know, Are you, Allah, you're going to put them there and all they're going to do is cause problems. <laughs> they were spot on. And they said, And all we do is worship you and praise you. And Allah Ta'ala says, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know something that you don't know. And that's like, the, that's like how Muslims live. We believe that Allah knows something that we don't know. Why, why, why? We believe that Allah knows something that we don't know. And in that acknowledgement, in that moment, we understand that this is the Rabbul Alameen. He's never stopped taking care of us. Even in the moments where we are confused, we're still being taken care of, right? That's why when the Prophet Sallallahu when the man came and said, I have a hard heart, he said, Go and wipe the head of the orphan. Go and put your hand on an orphan's head to spend time with that child, to have perspective on why your life is so good, is so, so good. Let's go ahead, inshallah, and take this moment to take a break. Uh, it's, it's almost 11, and I have to leave, inshallah, in about 30 minutes, but I want to give everyone at least five minutes to stretch their legs, walk around, uh, you know, wipe their tears, uh, inshallah. So we'll come back here. It's 10.59. We'll come back, inshallah, at 11.04. There's coffee in the back as well if you want to get some coffee. Barakallah fikum. All right. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa ala rasulillah. Okay, so we only have 15 minutes left uh, because it's Memorial Day weekend and the airport is from, uh, I had a friend who was traveling this morning. He said it was just a little bit busy. So I'm not going to be able to finish Surah Al-Fatiha giving it its right. But the good news is, uh, when I come back, we'll finish. But also uh, the good news is that we're going to get to a point that is a really, really beautiful, uh, it's a good stopping point. Uh, inshallah. So we just finished now ayah number two. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And now we see another phrase that looks very familiar. It looks very familiar because we just read it like six minutes ago. Right? So we had Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, and now we have Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim again. Now, when you look in the tafsir on this, on this verse, you'll see one word that a lot of the mufassirun, they say, tawkid, which in Arabic means emphasis. And while it's true that one of the details or one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats something is in fact emphasis, there is always going to be like some extended or some deeper layer of meaning to the Quran besides just something being emphasized. Emphasis is, a, is an entry point meaning, but there are other layers to this, okay? Um, one thing that I'll say is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again repeats this concept of his mercy in the sense that, like I said earlier, it is the most critical part of what he wants us to remember about him. So if Muhammad, going back to that example, met somebody on a plane and he introduced himself as Muhammad, who lives in California, but he's originally from Egypt, and if, that, if those two facts mean something to him, you better believe somehow, some way, he's going to find a way to work that back into conversation. Right? So in the conversation, he might say, yeah, in California, where I live, or in Egypt, where my parents are from and I'm from, well, you know what I mean? Why is he bringing it up again? Because, again, it's a part of him that he's proud of, and it's a part of him that he wants you to know. Like, hey, we've had a conversation, and there's a lot of things that we've talked about and we're going to talk about, but the thing that I need you to walk away from in this conversation is this point. So now we take this back to Allah. Allah Ta'ala knows that you're going through a lot in your day, and he knows that you are slammed with distractions. And he knows, Azawajal, that these distractions can cause you to have moments of confusion or doubt. The one thing he wants you to know and to remember as you recite this chapter 17 times in your prayers is that you are never, ever, ever outside of his mercy. You are never, ever ineligible for his mercy. If you ask for Allah's mercy, it will be given to you. If you seek it, it will be increased. It will be added. So much of our life when we struggle, one of the things that we don't do enough is ask Allah for his mercy. Oh Allah, have mercy on me. Oh Allah, send your mercy upon me, right? I'm being slammed right now, being destroyed by my schedule, my work, my family, whatever. I can't handle it. Oh Allah, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me in my situation. The other point that I love, which is amazing, it ties this verse to the next verse. The next verse, Maliki Yomiddin, the master of the day of judgment. Okay, Malik in Arabic tamlik means to have complete authority over something. So if I have tamlik, I am the one who is completely and totally in charge of whatever it is that I am the Malik of. So that's why they call the kings, right? The, they're the Malik. They are the, the, the kings of the, the land because they are the ones with complete authority. We already spoke about Rub. Rub is different because Rub is authority, but it includes what? It includes welfare, taking care of. Malik is more of the technical authority, that this person is the top of the chain. This is the highest part of the hierarchy, okay? Which day or which moment is Allah telling us he is the Malik of? Which day? The day of judgment. So there's a couple emotions. How do you feel when you hear this phrase, Malik Yom how do you feel? Allah is powerful. This is a day that everybody is going to be experiencing so many different things. Fear, anxiety, you know, confusion. And Allah is the one on that day who's in charge of everything. There's power. What else? Anyone else? Intimidation. Yeah, you're like, oh God. You know, if the first thing, what if Allah began the surah like this? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Maliki Yom al-Din. How does that change the cadence? How does that change the effect of the surah? 
it focuses more on his authority than his mercy, right? So what we notice is two things. Number one, if we take this verse in its own section, Allah is Maliki Yom din He is the master of the day of judgment. Couple things. Number one is that there is no one on that day that is going to be able to manipulate or change or, you know, mess with the outcomes. Allah Ta'ala is not somebody that on the day of judgment, Azza wa Jal is like unaware, out of, he's not, he's not somebody who's not in control. No, Allah is in complete control of the day of judgment. So it makes the person think to themselves, you know what, instead of worrying about all of these other people, right, in my life, I have to first and foremost remember that on the day of judgment, which is the day that will dictate my eternal position in my afterlife, I have to be worried about the one who's in charge on that day. You know, if you're someone's boss, then that person has to be worried about you. They don't have to be worried about anything else. Okay? If I'm Musa's father, my son, you guys, when I come every month, you're going to hear Musa and Iman a lot. I say it a lot. I'm Musa's father. Okay? Musa has to worry about what I think, not what his friend thinks or his friend's dad thinks or his friend's mom, right? Even his teacher. I give his teacher authority for eight hours a day or whenever he's at school. But if he comes home and says, Baba, my teacher said that I don't need to brush my teeth at night. First of all, ew. Second of all, I'm, the, I'm technically I'm the one in charge of you. So I, I appreciate your teacher's opinion, right? This is hypothetical, by the way. I appreciate your teacher's opinion, but if I say brush your teeth, you got to brush your teeth. You can't bring someone else into this conversation. On the day of judgment, Allah Ta'ala, he mentions a, a moment in Surah Qaf. On the day of judgment, Allah Ta'ala says that there will be a person that on that day, they will tell Allah that, oh Allah, it wasn't me that did it, it was shaitan. Shaitan was the one who did it. Shaitan's response, this is crazy. The person is standing there and they say, oh Allah, every prayer that I missed, every mistake I made, every sin I committed, every moment I forgot and neglected you, oh Allah, it was his fault. Now you think, okay, shaitan is a rajim, he's cursed, he's the, he's the devil, literally. He is the enemy of anything that is good. Allah would never want to give shaitan any, you know, I'm trying to use my words very carefully here. Allah is not going to give shaitan any wins on the day of judgment. Shaitan is definitively a loser since the time he denied Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, correct? But he says, رَبَّنَا مَا أَطْغَيْتُهُ وَلَكِنْ كَانَ فِي ضَلَالٍ بَعِيدٍ It says, shaitan says, you know, that, 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 was, uh, that wasn't me. This person had made their own decisions. And then Allah Ta'ala says, قَالَ لَا تَخْتَصِمُوا لدي. This is, don't argue, don't, don't quarrel, don't debate, don't do this in front of me now. Meaning what? It was your decision in this life to go against me. Shaitan might have, he may have whispered to you here and there. But ultimately, you made the choice. So on that day, that authority is felt. That authority is there. You cannot, you cannot maneuver. You cannot be slick. You cannot get out of a situation that ultimately was on you. May Allah Ta'ala protect us. But here's an amazing part that I love. And we have to zoom out a little bit. So... We have in the first verse, in the basmala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we have a mention of Allah's mercy, not once, but how many times? Twice. Alhamdulillahi Rabb. Rabb is a connotation here. The meaning of this verse definitely communicates Allah Ta'ala's mercy. So we're going to count this as one. So we have one mention of mercy, two mentions of mercy, three mentions of mercy, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Four, five mentions of mercy. We have five times 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned his mercy before the first time he even mentions accountability. Now, if we are Muslim, we believe that the Quran is the divine book and that it was revealed in a way on purpose. This is not, uh, what's the word? This is not like some board game, categories, or whatever, that, uh, whatever game where it's like you just toss things up and it is, no. The Quran, letter by letter, has purpose. Have you ever thought to yourself, why did Allah open Surah Al-Fatiha mentioning mercy over and over and over again before he mentions accountability one time? Why would he do this? Here's a better question. How does this make you feel? How does this ratio make you feel? Who said something back there? Hopeful. Hopeful. Very good. This makes me feel hopeful. So if I'm reading Maliki al Medin, I'm scared, right? But then I go back and I'm like, hold on. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman. Okay. The one who's the master on the Day of Judgment is also the one who's the most merciful. And it gives me hope that on that day, I know I'm going to have mistakes that I made. I know I'm going to have shortcomings. But Allah's mercy is greater than my fault, my flaws. So it gives me hope. What else does it give me? Huh? You feel protected. If you know the person in charge is merciful, then you show up and you say, I know that he's not going to do me wrong. Allah, in, in one of my Aqidah classes, I loved it. I was studying with the, the sheikh and it, someone asked a question about, you know, Qadr and heaven and hell. It's a kind of an intense answer. But he said, I want you to remember one thing. No one who should be in heaven will be in hell. That's all he said. <laughs> and then we moved on. Because people start asking, what if, what if someone's really good, really good, but Allah puts them in hell? My teacher was like, why would someone who's really good be in hell? And they're like, I don't know, like a accounting error or something? Like the audit didn't go well? Like, you know? <laughs> So my teacher was like, no one who should be in heaven will be in hell and vice versa. You're not going to show up in Jannah and shaitan's going to be there. Like, what are you doing here? No one who should be in hellfire will be in heaven. Okay? This is what Madik Yomadin means. So you're protected in the sense that you're like, okay, when I show up on the Day of Judgment, I know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to make any mistakes. Right? Allah Ta'ala will never oppress a single person. No one will ever, ever. On the Day of Judgment, you know what's crazy? Allah tells us, oh man, this is insane. Allah, when I say insane, I mean it in a good way. Sorry, I apologize. It's my language, my, my millennial uh, vocabulary. In the, in, the, in the Quran, when you have the dialogue between Allah and the people who, will, who are going to hellfire, you know, none of them claim that he's being unfair. None of them. You have not one single passage where they're like, this is not right. Not one. They all are regretful, remorseful, but they say, Ya laytani kuntu turaba. I wish I was dust. Like that's just, they own it. They own it. None of them say, I want to recount. Right? What they say is, Send us back. Give me one day. Give me one day. I'll hop on a plane, be in Mecca, make Umrah. I'm good. Oh Allah, I'll, I'll give me one day. I'll live it perfectly. I'll wake up for Fajr. I'll go to the Masjid for Dhuhr. I'll do Asr. I'll fast. I'll break my fast at Maghrib. I'll pray Isha. I'll pray with her. I'll kiss my parents. I'll do, I'll just give me one day. Allah Ta'ala says, no, you had your chance. You didn't only have one day. You had 50, 60, 70, 80 years. Now you're asking for one day? You want 24 hours? How many thousands of hours did you have? So when you look at the Quran, it's interesting because the dialogue is so honest. No one is going to say, oh Allah, on the day of judgment, you're being unfair to me. Not a single person can make that claim. Allah Ta'ala will never oppress a single person. May Allah Ta'ala forgive us. And may he make us never have to have any bad experience on that day.
May Allah Ta'ala protect us from ever seeing or smelling or hearing or anything with the hellfire. May Allah Ta'ala take us straight, straight from the day of resurrection into Al-Firdaus Al-A'la with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah Ta'ala always make us people who remember His mercy more than His wrath. May Allah Ta'ala make us people that represent to others His mercy more than His wrath. We ask Allah Ta'ala to allow ourselves to be showered in the mercy of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala and that we are given this mercy time and time again. We ask Allah Ta'ala that when we make mistakes, that He forgive us for our mistakes and He doesn't hold us accountable for the mistakes that we make that we forget about. He forgives us for the sins that we've committed in the past and that He gives us guidance to follow the straight path in the future. Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastafiru kama tubu ilayk. I want to apologize to everybody for not being able to finish this, but I will leave you with a lesson. I was unable to finish this because this is the nature of the Qur'an. The, the more time you give the book of Allah, the more you can dive deep and swim in the, in the beautiful pearls in the ocean that you've, that you've been enjoying. You immerse yourself in this. And I want to tell you something. I know that I was here kind of facilitating this discussion, but one of the things that I want everyone here to leave with is, the, is the, the conviction and the belief that you can do this on your own. You can open the Quran and read and reflect on your own. Absolutely. You're not, you're not deriving rulings. No one's saying, okay, because of this, I believe this is haram or this. Is, no. That's stuff that we leave for trained people. But every Muslim should be able to open up one of those books in the back and should be able to read and say, how does this... Notice my questions, by the way. I didn't ask you guys, what ruling do we take from this? I said, how does this make you feel? How does it make you feel knowing that Allah's mercy is mentioned so many times? And, and, and this is what we call tadabbur. This is just spending time with the Qur'an. Two hours might be a lot every day, but we can give the Qur'an ten minutes. Get your coffee, get your breakfast... You know, get your avocado toast and coffee. Cost you fourteen dollars. Thirty-eight percent tip. You know, they do the whole. You can. Would you like to finish your transaction? They stare at you in the eye. You're like you didn't do anything. <laughs> no, no. Baristas, you have to tip. Baristas do a lot. Baristas do a lot. But at Taco Bell, when you're ordering a, a, a pickup, anyways, no tipping there. Okay. Um, anyways, but you, you, you have your breakfast, you have your coffee, you have whatever, you have your tea. Just spend 10 minutes with the book of Allah, man. Just spend 10 minutes. I promise you, I promise you it'll make your life better. Inshallah. We ask Allah Ta'ala to accept. I apologize. Normally, I'd love to kick it and hang around, but I have to head to the airport for my flight. So inshallah, I'll see you guys uh, June 15th for our next session. Uh, what we're going to call, inshallah, hopefully, hard work SoCal. Inshallah. So we'll be able to. How many of you have heard of Roots before? Okay, there we go. So inshallah, we'll be doing some fun stuff inshallah. May Allah Ta'ala bless the Rahmah Center. May Allah Ta'ala continue to make this place a means of khair and barakah. And may Allah Ta'ala take care of and, and, and bring nothing but goodness to those, the volunteers, those people that serve tirelessly, you know, and, and take care of, of the house of Allah. They have special, special favor with him. Subhanakallah, bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.